Hello and welcome to another complete Cambridge IGCSE biology lesson where you'll learn absolutely everything you need to know on topic 10.1 diseases and immunity. As always we'll be following the Cambridge syllabus exactly and we'll cover absolutely everything you need to know for your final exam. For topic 10.1 you need to know about pathogens, disease transmission, the body's defense systems and control measures used to prevent the spread of disease. For extended you also need to understand the terms active and passive immunity, the process of vaccination and the bacterial disease cholera. So pathogens are disease-causing organisms and include viruses, certain bacteria, fungi and protoctista, and other organisms like parasitic worms. They cause damage to the cells and disrupt the normal functioning of tissues, giving rise to symptoms and triggering an immune response in the host. A transmissible disease is a disease in which the pathogen can be passed on from one host to another, either by direct or indirect contact. Direct contact refers to the transfer of pathogens through blood or other bodily fluids. For example, being injected by a needle previously used by an infected individual allows pathogens to enter the bloodstream directly. Certain diseases are also passed on in bodily fluids during sexual intercourse. Indirect contact refers to the transmission of pathogens via contaminated surfaces, food, animals and particles in the air. For example, raw meat harbours bacteria that's killed off when cooking. If however raw food is prepared using the same knife or cutting board, or the chef doesn't wash their hands, bacteria from the meat can be transferred and ingested. Whenever we sneeze, cough, talk or even breathe, we expel a fine spray of liquid particles that remain suspended in the air for some time. Pathogens in these tiny droplets may then be inhaled by other people or land on exposed food. Bacteria is also spread by insects like houseflies, which transfer bacteria from decaying food or feces to fresh food via their feet and mouthparts. Now humans come into contact with harmful pathogens all the time, but for most of us, illness is fairly uncommon. This is due to the body's defense mechanisms, which include the skin, mucus, stomach acid, and of course white blood cells. So glands in the stomach lining secrete gastric juice containing hydrochloric acid, which kills the majority of any bacteria ingested with food. The outer layer of the skin, called the epidermis, acts as a physical barrier, preventing pathogens from entering the body. The hairs in the nasal passages help to filter out bacteria and foreign particles in the air, while the lining of the trachea and bronchi produces mucus that traps pathogens and forms a protective layer. The mucus is then carried away from the lungs by ciliated cells in the epithelium. Finally, white blood cells attack pathogens that have found their way into the blood and tissues. Many pathogens are highly transmissible, so control measures are put in place to limit their spread. You need to explain the importance of a clean water supply, hygienic food preparation, good personal hygiene, waste disposal, and sewage treatment. So water contaminated with sewage or animal waste contains harmful bacteria and could infect vast numbers of people if used for drinking. To prevent this from occurring, raw sewage should be treated and kept away from water supplies, and drinking water should be purified. Water treatment involves filtration to remove larger particles and chlorination, which kills the pathogens. Those who don't have access to a treated water supply can boil it instead, as bacteria, viruses and other pathogens are unable to survive at such high temperatures. Raw meat carries bacteria that may cause food poisoning if consumed. This can be avoided by thoroughly cooking the meat, consuming pasteurised milk and eggs, washing the hands regularly and ensuring that uncooked meat is prepared separately from any food that's likely to be consumed raw. In addition, previously cooked food should never be warmed up, as raising the temperature may cause bacteria to proliferate. A variety of pathogens, including the bacteria that cause typhoid, are present in the feces of infected people and may be transferred if the sufferer doesn't wash their hands. In particular, hands should be washed after using the toilet and before touching food. Pathogens that breed on rotting food and other waste may be transferred by the bodies of flies and vermin if improperly stored or disposed of. Dustbins should be strong and have a closely fitting lid, and the waste should be taken away and either burned or buried. Finally, to prevent the harmful bacteria present in human feces from entering the water supply, sewage must be treated in a sewage works before being released into rivers. Okay, so that's everything for core, so we'll move on now to the extended content, beginning with the term active immunity. So active immunity can be defined as the defense against a pathogen by antibody production in the body. Antibodies produced by lymphocytes 
ligaments bind to antigens that line the surfaces of pathogens. This either destroys the pathogens directly or marks them, making it easier for phagocytes to locate and ingest them. Antigens and antibodies have specific shapes that are complementary, meaning a particular antibody only binds to one kind of pathogen. When an infection has been fought off, some of the lymphocytes that produce the specific antibodies become memory cells and stay in the lymph nodes for some time. If the same antigen is detected by the body a second time, the memory cells quickly divide and make more antibodies to neutralize the threat. This is called active immunity and explains why once you've recovered from a disease like chickenpox or measles, you're very unlikely to catch the same disease again. Active immunity can also be gained by vaccination, which we'll return to in just a moment, but first a couple of points on passive immunity. So passive immunity is a short-term defense against a pathogen by antibodies acquired from another individual. Newborn babies haven't had the time to build up an active immunity, so instead receive antibodies from the mother. Antibodies are passed on in the last three months of pregnancy through the placenta and after the baby is born in breast milk. This protects infants from contracting diseases while their own immune systems are developing, but it only provides short-term protection as no memory cells are produced. Now, whenever an individual is exposed to a pathogen to which they haven't yet gained an immunity, the patient could suffer symptoms or even die before the white blood cells have had time to act. To prevent this from happening, vaccinations can be used to gain an active immunity beforehand. Weakened pathogens or their antigens are introduced to the body by injection or swallowing. This stimulates an immune response by lymphocytes, which produce the appropriate antibodies and then become memory cells. If the person is exposed to the pathogen later, they already have a long-term active immunity, which stops the disease from developing. Finally, you need to know about one specific transmissible disease. So cholera is a disease caused by a bacterium which is transmitted in contaminated water. When the bacteria are ingested, they reproduce and invade the epithelial cells of the small intestine. They release toxins that irritate the intestinal lining, resulting in the secretion of large quantities of water and salts, including chloride ions. The ions draw even more water into the gut by osmosis, causing serious diarrhea, dehydration, and even kidney failure. Treatment of cholera involves intravenous rehydration and replacement of salts, and the use of an antibiotic to kill the bacteria. Well done, you've just covered absolutely everything you need to know on topic 10.1, diseases and immunity. If you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate your subscription, and I'll see you next time for topic 11.1, gas exchange in humans.